And uh, let me introduce the panel that we have today. We've got, uh, we've got Michael Nehemiah from Bayern Munich. He's the head of performance analytics. We've got Ben Davis, who's the chief executive officer from a company called Fizzle. And Ryan Craig, who's the director of digital media for Duke University Athletics. So uh, as we mentioned, we're going to go 45 minutes with content. We'll leave a little time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. I've got an iPad. So you guys, I think, te text your questions through the app, and then I'll ask the, the panelists the questions. So to start off, to give you a little sense of what SAP does in the world of sports, we've got a quick video for you. So let me roll the video. In the world of sports, winners have risen up and victories rewarded those who fought for success in 2014. SAP has fought alongside them to help achieve their goals. SAP HANA has brought sports facts and analysis to more than 50 million fans. Athletes, coaches and teams worldwide have benefited from detailed insights and new possibilities to prepare for future challenges. Thanks to SAP, we have the possibility to, uh, to be very individual with the player, to work fast and smart. SAP is the perfect match for the WTA. I'm trying to get as much information as possible from the analysis to perform even better with my next ride. Before we had the SAP analytics, you were relying on your feeling. And now you are able to compare with objective data. I would say that SAP has changed the game of sports just by making people more aware that there's other things out there. It's quite nice for the fans to get to know the person a little bit different than just hitting a golf ball from A to B. We'll have a completely new digitalized world which will be state of the art at our club. And this is the goal SAP is working for with us. gives you a sense for uh, what SAP does in the world of sports and entertainment. We have solutions that are both sports specific and industry agnostic, things like analytics obviously, that uh, help companies run simpler. And a lot of times when we're dealing with companies, in the past three to five years we've seen technology really creating an inflection point for the world of sports and entertainment. Some of the different variables and things that they're dealing with are similar in other industries that we, that we work with as well. They've got huge data silos, both on the business side as well as on the, the, the sports operation side. They're uh, now investigating new sensor technologies, wearable and non-wearable technologies. We'll talk a little bit about that today with Michael. Uh, they're trying to leverage and use data as a competitive edge. Um, and one thing that we're gonna talk about a lot today is around fan identity. So these are things that I think are creating an inflection point in the world of sports and entertainment. And if you look at uh, how we focus on this industry, we categorize it in four key areas, team and player performance, fan engagement, analytics, and big data. And then a lot of these clubs are actually looking to move a lot of their applications 
into the cloud. So SAP has a great focus in that area as well. When we go into these organizations, it's really about how are they managing their data. And we ask them questions such as, how do they, how, what if they could handle mountains of data, ask any question in real time, and deliver a single version of the truth, as well as gain a competitive advantage, both in terms of understanding who their fans are, as well as gaining a competitive advantage on the field, or on the pitch, or on the court. So these are interesting questions that we ask our, our, uh, our customers, and, and with that, the four, again, the four key focus areas of team performance, fan engagement, sales and marketing, and business operations, we're going to touch on three of these today. So our panelists, again, I mentioned Ryan Craig, who's the uh, director of digital media from Duke Athletics, Michael, head of match analysis for Bayern Munich, and Ben Davis, CEO from Fizzle. So let's get started right away. Ryan, let's, uh, let's start with you. Yeah, so, so as the uh, as the director, <laughs> sorry, as the director of digital media for uh, Duke, I assume you're responsible for everything, web, social, anything digital related for the athletics department. Um, let's talk about a project that you started last year on on when we talk about data, uh, your statistical data for your men's basketball team. If you want share with us that, that, uh, that story. Yeah, I think the most interesting part about this project, and it's, we, we gave it this hashtag Duke MBB stats moniker to, to play into the social world we live in now. There's a picture of our locker room. The ironic part about this project is though we only started constructing it in this past year, uh, probably without knowing it, we began this project about 10 years ago. There's a guy by the name of Curtis Snyder who was in my position two versions ago of myself. He's now since moved to the University of Colorado and works out in the athletics department there. He's actually in Anchorage, Alaska today uh, with their ski team of all places. But he uh, was really passionate about Duke basketball, as, as a lot of people are. Uh, Duke basketball is a uh, love him or hate him type program, and he loved him. And so he took a lot of his time outside of his job, and he started to gather up as much data as he could from box scores dating all the way back into the first decade of the 20th century. That in, meant going into a library and looking up microfilm, trying to piece together newspaper articles, and he developed this database on goduke.com, the first version of it. And it was something that he was really proud of and that, and that we all adopted as kind of the, the home base that people would go to to figure out what they wanted to know from a statistics perspective for Duke men's basketball. Uh, we have 26 sports at Duke, soon to be 27 but certainly men's basketball is the most well-known, and so he started there, and we've actually done some work as well in football, women's basketball, and on into some other sports, but for this project, we, we tackled men's basketball only. This is what it looked like before. This is you know, your, your classic before image, more of a cell table structure, but all the information's there. It's probably uh, the most thorough collection of data for any collegiate sports team, uh, we've looked around. We don't know that anybody else has been able to go back this far. A lot of teams have the data, but it's sitting in some storage bin in the basement. And or in Curtis, books. Exactly, yeah. And, and so Curtis had to rifle through all that stuff, and he, he digitized it all. So this was the first iteration, and then we realized, uh, and speaking with Frank, with uh, Duke and SAP have a larger relationship, uh, particularly on the campus side of, of the world. So Frank was down... Um, talking to some folks that are involved in that side of the world. Came over to athletics, we tried to figure out if there was a way we could work together. We thought maybe some website redesign, perhaps some digital archives, and then we thought, wait a second, what about this database that Curtis has? Maybe we can breathe some new life into it. It's, it's a connection point between alumni and fans and media. People refer to this all the time. So I wonder if there's a way we could take this to the next level, and so that's, that's sort of how we decided uh, to, to focus on this area. Yeah, so let's go from the before page to showing a couple of screenshots of, of what, the, uh, what the current uh, Duke MBB stats looks like. So if we can fast forward, why don't we talk a little bit about this page, uh, if you don't yeah, mind, Yeah, there you see our weather alert uh, down there in North Carolina, with uh, the eight inches of snow we just got. So, but anyway, so this is, this is what, uh, this is our goduke.com website. You see the masthead up there at the top, main navigation menu. You know, one of the things that we really wanted to do is, uh, and to touch on one of Frank's points earlier, the, the silo that I'm sort of speaking on today is the fan engagement side. And it's how do we get people to interact with goduke.com, stay in that ecosystem, and then we're able to market to them in, in different ways. So 
I think we'll touch on that a little bit later, but this is sort of what it looks like. This is the leaderboard, or the, the homepage, if you will, of, of the project, of the database. Diving in a little further, there's a menu at the top left where you can see a leaderboard in terms of the players that are currently on the team, a leaderboard in terms of their careers, so where Quinn Cook stacks up among the best that Duke's ever had in terms of points, uh, and there in that call-out window was the... Oh, I'm sorry, Ron. I'm no, you're fine. Uh, the list of the stats. Those are all the stats that we have, keeping in mind that some of these stats didn't exist beyond a certain time. That's one of the hardest parts about collecting all this data is right. figuring out when teams started keeping track of the three-point line, for instance. It, it actually was introduced, then it was taken away, then it was back again. Certain schools began keeping track of blocked shots before others. It's just a really tough thing to wrap your arms around entirely. So those are all the stats that appear at some point on the page. Here's an example of a player page. That's Emil Jefferson. Uh, there you see that's uh, the career leader um, in terms of rebounds. So you see some of the greats all time at Duke. Sheldon Williams, Mike Jaminski, Christian Leitner, Mason Plumley, Randy Denton, and where Emil Jefferson stacks up in accordance with them. So there's, there's always this top five and then where that player is. Getting into some player comparisons here, you're able to toggle on that left side, the menu, select different stats. It'll populate not only up top, but down below as well. Uh, the top five in all these different categories that are either offensive or defensive. Uh, so in this case, it's offensive uh, because you've got assists, you've got points, et cetera. So a lot of different things up to the top right. You can see uh, the social, the sharing element, obviously playing again into that hashtag that we incorporated into the name. So we're trying, to, we're trying to live in the spaces that our fans are. We're trying to live how they're, how they're living. We know that analytics and data visualization is something that people really enjoy. And so this project made a ton of sense on a lot of different levels. And, and of course, uh, you know, SAP and NTT data were, were hugely helpful in, in us realizing that vision. Yep. And we'll come, we'll come back to this uh, project to talk a bit more about how we incorporated, even through the athletics department, other departments within Duke University and how the project structure was set up. But uh, thank you, Ryan, for that. So let's, Michael, let's move to you. So um, the head of analysis for, uh, for Bayern Munich, I'm not sure if the folks in the audience know a lot about Bayern Munich, but certainly a, a, a long level of sus high sustained success for the team. Um, tell us a little bit about how the use of data and analytics and technology uh, is incorporated into your work with the organization? Well, the process is um, <clears throat> we have, uh, we collect video and uh, data material and we do it uh, mostly by ourselves or try to do as much as possible by ourselves because the video material we use, we, um, we can't use TV footage. Uh, we need the panoramic view and the data we use, we collect by ourselves because uh, most of the data that is collected by uh, Opta and uh, different companies are not uh, really useful for uh, our kind of work. And um, so we have data, lots of data, um, that gets in uh, a database. Uh, um, and that's where uh, SAP is coming in. Um, uh, and for the last 10, 15 years, we have developed a different kind of uh, solutions for uh, medical database, we had a scouting database, we had uh, lots of tools for, for match uh, analyzers. Uh, they were very good, but uh, they were separate. Uh, and uh, now um, uh, with SAP, we, we try to get it all together in one and uh, make the make the process or speed up the analytic process. So uh, for me, technology is all about uh, getting uh, as much information in uh, less amount of time. So we can, we, we as an analyst, we can uh, spend uh, the time more on the, um, more on the small little details, I call it. Uh, um, and uh, let the, Big work due to the technology. That's what we try and uh, automatization uh, of, of, uh, of work. Uh, for example, um, if you have uh, uh, try to get information about a central defender, and uh, then I want to know, uh, um, want to see video, and what we try to do is, for example, um, get automatization of. Uh, of uh, cent uh, central defenders, or you have uh, 
So you don't want to see the, the, the successful passes he played. You want to see it the successful passes he played under pressure. And this is only possible with, if you connect data and video material. So that's the key of, of our work is to combine these two things. Um, and then, of course, if you have this technology, then you need a good analytic, uh, analytic uh, department uh, with manpower. Uh, at Bayern, we have uh, around eight people only working for the first team in this area. Um, and you have to sit, what's very important, you have to sit at the, in the coaching office. You have to, this has to be very, um, it's not good if you're sitting somewhere in, a, in another building. You have to sit right uh, where the coach is sitting because you have to think like a coach. You have to As adapt. part of the coaching team. Yeah, right? as a part, yeah. yeah. You are a coach. Yeah. You see yourself as a coach. Yeah. yeah. And um, so this is important. And then you need, of course, a coach. This most important thing. Uh, you have to, you need a coach who is taking uh, analysis and uh, technology to, uh, for, for his work. Uh, for example, uh, as Pep, Guardiola arrived uh, at Bayern. The f in the first week, he said, uh, f the first thing he said, uh, you are the first, you are the most important department for me. And I, well, okay, we thought, well, okay, uh, it's just um, uh, wants to have, uh, get in contact and uh, makes, uh, and, um, and another thing he said, uh, a, a big part of my work uh, uh, is taking place in the auditorium. The auditorium is at Bayern is a place where we show videos for the players, and after, four or five weeks, we, we, we know what he meant, because uh, that is the area where he can put his ideas in the head of the player. Uh, and um, so you need, in order to, to use analytics and technology very well, you need the right coach. And there are not so many out there right now. Um, um, and of course, at the end, you need the player. If you have a good analyze uh, department and a good coach, and you don't have the player who can play, uh, bring it on the pitch, it doesn't. Uh, the whole thing doesn't make sense. So you have to, um, for example, if you have to, um, you analyze that, uh, or you have your match plan says you have to. Your winger has to go one against one at the end, and then you have a winger who can do it. Uh, you don't have to analyze it. So the player is always. The final thing, it's important to, to have the right uh, player. Yeah, we, we, talk, we talked a bit last night, and uh, I was fortunate enough to go to the NBA Tech Summit, where they had a panel made up of uh, Charles Barkley, R.C. Buford, who's the GM of the Spurs, um, Mark Cuban, Magic Johnson, Phil Jackson, and they asked the question, does analytics help win championships? And it was a mixed bag across the entire panel of some people that I think, like you said, you have to have the right coach certain coaches that value this part of that the team uh, are trying to use it as a competitive edge. And in and of itself, I assume it doesn't, you know, it's got to be worked into the, the normal mechanics of coaching a team and looking at talent and all that. Yeah. But uh, it was an interesting panel discussion how uh, a lot of them felt this when they asked the question to R.C. Buford, how has analytics played a part in your success over the past few years? He said, his comment was, well, the team started playing well, so that's why we, uh, that's why we won, which was pretty interesting. But um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and even some of the conversations we had last night, incorporating the, the technology and the analytics into the tactics of the game on analyzing things like corner kicks, right? Talk about that for a minute, uh, if you don't mind, yeah. on how you look at certain areas of where the corner kick would, would end up, if you don't mind yeah. sharing that with the audience. This is, uh, I think that, that uh, our work can, uh, uh, you can see it on the pitch, that's the most important thing you, of, of our work. If you can't see what you, you work on the pitch, it's worth nothing. So uh, that's, uh, you have to, that's with everything, you have, with the technology, you have to develop for the pitch, you have to work for the pitch, that's the most important thing. And if you don't see it on the pitch, uh, quit your job. Um, I give you an example. It's a easy, a very easy example about uh, corner kicks. How we do it, um, we 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 look at the uh, opponent corner kicks. Um, in which area uh, they they put the ball, um, and uh, for example, we played against Manchester City in the last couple of years many times, and they they always put the ball between the five yard line and the penalty point, <clears throat> and. Uh, we play zone defense uh, at Bayern, um, and 
So we changed our zone because they always put the ball there. Um, we normally we have four, four, two, um, and we we put in this area where they put always a ball. We just put one man more, um, and in the game they did exactly like we we we, we thought they would do, and this man uh, saved, uh, or how you say it in English, uh, saved. Uh, they didn't uh, they didn't gain a chance. Huh? So this is a, just a small example where you where you can see. Uh, how how the our, our work uh, gets on the pitch. That's, mm -hmm. that's very important. It's the same with with the technology uh, we develop with SAP together. The, the, you can you can break it down to the to the sentence you have to develop for the pitch. And the most of the companies don't do that. The most the companies come to us and tell us. Um, uh, oh, we have, sir, we, we've developed something for the media, uh, a fancy tool, uh, you can paint and, you know, you don't need painting in, in, in uh, coaching. A uh, coach doesn't need to paint. <laughs> you need a laser pointer and that's it. Um, and SAP did something different. They came to us and said, uh, um, what do you want? Um, and so we could tell them our vision, what we want, what, really, what we really need. And it doesn't have to be necessarily fancy or uh, bling bling. It has to be uh, useful for the, for the coach and for the pitch. So We uh, like the fancy bling bling too. Though, yeah. Michael. As long as it's <laughs> A little bit, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. A little bling bling is nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me change gears a bit and go, go to you, Ben. So, Ben, let's talk about fan engagement again for a second. Um, tell, me about, uh, tell me about how Fizzle is working with sports teams and other consumer-focused teams on managing fan data, uh, from both from an engagement standpoint as well as from a, from a big data standpoint. Sure. So, um, you know, as an, uh, an aspiring entrepreneur and a, and a love of uh, sports, our goal really was to um, uh, figure out a fan engagement platform that uh, could be used by sports teams to... Uh, engage with their with their fans. So our first generation solution was uh, an SMS platform, and uh, you know it was it was great. Um, SMS was a great way to, um, to to stay in touch with your fans. It's a great way of uh, communicating. Um, but after after a couple years, and uh, having the benefit of working with organizations like Madison Square Garden and Fox and s some other uh, good customers, we realized that. Um, there was so much more than, than SMS. And if we were going to really uh, uh, increase our value offering, we had to figure out how to um, not only manage data from multiple channels, but we needed to figure out how to really consolidate uh, a fan profile into one 360 degree view um, of that fan, and then use those engagement channels to effectively um, communicate with that fan, uh, basically on, on their terms. So we've had a pretty significant evolution of, of products. Um, and it's been kind of a, a learn-as-you-go process, kind of like building the plane and flying it at the same time, which is scary. Um, uh, but our, our customers have been great to work with us, and we've gotten a lot of um, great feedback on, on you know, what our customers really needed. And what we ended up with is uh, something that we call engagement automation. Um, and engagement automation really is the combination of what we perceive to be the four main kind of pillars, if you will, of digital marketing. So we're talking about mobile marketing, which, which was our roots, uh, marketing automation, uh, social media management, and uh, data visualization. And not data visualization from a business intelligence standpoint, but really um, uh, uh, displaying uh, a graphic representation of social media conversations and what's happening in the Twittersphere. And uh, you know, it was our thought that really the combination of all of this capability in one single ecosystem solution would make it much easier and much more efficient for sports teams and, and, and uh, brands that invest in sports to really manage the entire uh, ecosystem uh, of fan engagement, all the way from uh, identification and engagement to, to monetization. Um, now, when you bring all of this stuff together, um, it's, it's a tremendous amount of uh, information, a tremendous amount of data, and one element that we absolutely could not, uh, could not build on our own was a robust business intelligence 
uh, 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 solutions. So rather than building it, um, you know, we partnered with SAP to really help bring that data to life so that our customers can react to that data uh, in real time. Where, where do you see sports teams today in creating this vision or this setup and platform? Um, in, in let's fo you're focus primarily in North America and the US. Where do you see sports teams today in that area? Are they, are 50% of the teams looking at it? Uh, they might all be looking at it this way, but how many are really starting to build that, that data platform? Yeah, so, you know, um, sports teams, I, 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 I think, we're a little bit behind the eight ball uh, when it came to technology. I, I can't remember the exact stat, but I know, you know, four or five years ago, there was not one um, chief technology officer in a, in a sports franchise or VP of digital. And, and that is absolutely changing. And I think, you know, that's a result of owners realizing the importance of data and, and technology and kind of bringing that mentality from their core businesses to the sports teams that, that they own. Um, and so every sports team, I think, is, is thinking about it, but really only a handful are really thinking about it um, in terms of the future and where fan engagement is going. Um, um, a lot of teams have pieces of fan engagement, and the challenge is that it's disjointed. And so when one system is not talking to another or you've got a fan record in your email system, uh, versus your point of sale system, then it's very difficult to really get a grip on exactly who that fan is and, and what they're doing. I mean, you know, to really understand who a fan is and what they want, you've got to look at all of the engagement channels. You've got to analyze everything concurrently, and only then can you really understand uh, who that fan is and what they want and, uh, and what context they want it and, and the timing of what they want. Sports fans, I believe are the smartest people uh, on earth, with the exception of a few. Um, uh, but you know, they're very demanding. Were you, were you referring <laughs> to me on that? No, ben, no. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. Good. No, Thank you. No, no. Um, you but, know, but what's what's interesting? Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you know, we've talked to a lot of the teams as well, and sometimes in some cases they're dealing with 10 or 15 or 20 different data sources, right? But understanding who the fan is or, or really trying to create personalized touches to the fan, they're only using one or two of those data streams, right? They're yeah. using maybe ticket transaction history, some demographic data, and, but they're not really pulling in these other sources to create more, let's say, actionable insights from having a profile of a fan. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, fans engage through multiple channels. Right. And if you're not analyzing across those channels, then you're not getting a true snapshot of, yeah. of, of who that person is. And then, and then you know, fans want to be communicated to on their terms. You know, some fans prefer Twitter, some fans prefer email. So you can't just blast fans you know, through yeah. one channel. I mean, you've got to be intelligent about it and understand you know, that this fan wants to receive their video content through YouTube, but this fan wants their video content through email, and this fan wants their video content through Twitter, so you've got to be conscious of that, and you've got to really um, cater to that fan. And 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 otherwise, and I assume it's intrusive for that fan. Absolutely, it, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Let's um, let's go back to you, Ryan, on the on the Duke project again, and talk a bit more about the the stats project. You know, a hundred, you know, one hundred and nine years of of data coming into the the system. It, it, when you, when you decided to make that leap, I know you had seen, you and I had talked about the NBA stats page, which, yep. you know, if you, any of you have gone to NBA stats, uh, it's a pretty incredible collection of data around the NBA going back to 1946. You guys saw that as sort of your vision, but with Duke, you had an opportunity to create a project structure that was a bit different. Tell us about a little bit about the project setup that you had within, within the project. Yeah, one of the exciting parts of this project for me personally in going into it, one of my goals was to breach the, uh, the isolation that athletics departments often find themselves a part of on a university campus. There is not necessarily a lot of working across the aisle, if you will. Um, there is, there's always a little bit of friction there at institutions of higher education, folks that think it's should just be students. Others think there's too much uh, commercialization of sports. And um, this project was really an opportunity to reach out to other members of campus. And I mentioned the SAP relationship already. 
with folks on campus, but our project there at the bottom left, uh, there's seven circles there. Most projects in college athletics don't have about half of those because they don't involve campus. So here we were able to build a team together through the University Alliances program with SAP that then required faculty sponsorship and student involvement, which was great. And so we went to our Fuqua School of Business, which is uh, renowned, of course. Uh, Kevin Brilliant led our student team from there. And then uh, we were able to, to work this project not only through them, but then through the co-innovation lab that's housed in the undergraduate portion of campus. Uh, students in the computer science school and major wanted to be involved. Professors, once they heard about what we were doing, they're always looking for sets of data to use for their classes. And sports is an area that people tend to be interested in, and so they always want to have more data sets that have to do with sports. So the way we structure the project, and over on the right there, you just see some of the, some of the different items we wanted to tick off. But, but the way we structured it was uh, a system of outreach. It was how can, how can we make this a part of the greater Duke University community, not only now, but then continuing on. Uh, there's a club in the Fuqua School of Business uh, that's involved with sports. This is now an officer position in that club that will then tend to this project in years to come. Same thing with the co-innovation lab, same thing on the computer science side of things. And so you know, not only obviously do you want to build a project for now, but you've got to make sure it's sustained over the years to come. And, and so that's, that's how we piece together the team. Um, as I said, you can see all the different constituency groups on there. It was a, it's a great way to um, involve other folks that aren't necessarily always involved with athletics to reach out and work together from uh, the Office of Information, Information Technology on campus and our Vice President of Duke, Tracy Futhi. She wants more student involvement in projects like this. So it was just a, a really great situation. It's not only help us, helping us accomplish that goal of actually building out this data visualization tool, but then it's, it's incorporating all these other people as well. Um, so from a, a project management standpoint, it was, it was a home run. I remember speaking with you and, and the folks in the sports club asking them if there was, would be anyone interested in working on the project and uh, I think it got up to the hundreds yeah. within a couple of days. <laughs> so it was, it was a pretty exciting project. And having the, the great volunteers and having Kevin work on the project was, uh, was excellent. One of the other things is going down this feasibility study when they went and researched other websites that do a phenomenal job of visualizing and showcasing data. They incorporated some of those best practices into what we ultimately wanted to show, at least from a phase one perspective. Right? Yeah, and I think the other thing too to note, we went into this with a by Duke, for Duke mentality. So we wanted, obviously with the help of SAP and NTT, we wanted this really to be sort of an organic effort, uh, one that we, we crowdsourced to try to build out not only the initial phase, but also the phases to come. And we'll get to that a little bit later um, about in, in terms of what's next. But when we say by Duke, you know, it's not just Duke Athletics, it's by Duke and the graduate students and the undergraduate students and the larger community and then for Duke, for the alumni, for the current students, for the current graduates, uh, prospects, you know, soon to be potentially, uh, both from a student athlete perspective and from the general student population, perhaps future uh, Duke students. So uh, the by Duke, for Duke was sort of our mantra through this entire thing and we gathered up as many people as we could uh, to, to make it happen. Yeah, right. Michael, let's switch gears a bit and talk a bit about uh, uh, performance data. We, we talked about uh, technology and analytics and whether or not coaches really see the value in this and being able to use it as a competitive advantage. What about the players? Where's the, where's the, uh, where are the players at when they look at your role and how you bring that technology and some of the insight that they might not otherwise see? How, is it, how, is the, how are the players on Bayern Munich accepting your role and, and the, the, uh, the value that you bring? Well, they, they can uh, prepare much better now um, with the use of uh, the technology that's uh, there. Uh, um, for example, uh, if you uh, take uh, also, again, there are, would be lots of uh, examples uh, for it, but it's hard to explain without video. Um, and the video work is kind of confidential, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. But I give you an example about um, uh, the semifinal uh, we played against Real Madrid a couple of years ago. Um, and we prepared our goalkeeper for, uh, for uh, the penalty. And um, 
Ronaldo for uh, shot the shot the penalty, and um, our analyst said that uh, he if he uh, in his first steps if he makes a little curve he most of the time he shoots in the uh, on the right side, and uh, if he slows down a little bit he most of the time he shoots on the left side. Um, and then we looked at what he does under pressure, uh, what if he does it always or just in a, and uh, under pressure the percentage went even up. So um, during the game, uh, uh, Ronaldo had two penalties and he showed us both. <laughs> so, but we were just able to catch one. So um, that's, that's just one example where, he, where, a, where a player can profit from, from analysis. Of course, if, if he shoots uh, the penalty very hard and precise, you don't have a chance even if you know, uh, you know it. But uh, um, so, and there, so, so there are many examples even uh, in the game. If you know if a, player, a winger goes from, uh, often from the outside to the inside, um, uh, then as a defender, you can do something against it. Uh, to a certain point, if Arjen Robben does it, our player, the most people know that he goes from the outside to the inside, but still they don't have a chance because he's just too good. Um, so I think they, they uh, profit a lot uh, from, from the way we are now able to present them data and, and, and video material. Um, and of course they profit a lot because the coach can uh, show his vision and show his match plan much better now with uh, use of data and video material. So, so we had a we had a screenshot up there of um, the the application that we had built for the German national team to yeah. prepare for World Cup. I know you're familiar with that because some of your players were on the team. Yeah. Um, if talk about that a little bit, I know in the bottom right hand corner you can see the the application that was from a video camera where we embedded analytics on top. How did the players react to this sort of technology? Well, first of all, I think it's, it's what, what makes it good is that you combine the three most important things. Uh, it's uh, good video material, so you need a panoramic view. So the system uses panoramic view. Um, then the second thing, you have to combine it with data. And the graphics thing, you can show uh, in the system, you, you are able to combine uh, or make lines between the uh, defenders and you can show distances and you um, it's a really really good tool and um, so still we have to develop a lot now what we do is at Bayern we take this tool and uh, um, try to adapt it to to the club uh, needs because um, uh, what a good good story was that uh, as um, at the, after the World Cup, Thomas Müller and Philipp Lahm came to me and said, hey, uh, Michael, I, uh, uh, why we don't have this? And the, in, the, in the World Cup, they had a terminal uh, in the, at, their, uh, where the, at the camp where they were staying. They had a terminal from SAP where, where they could go and, and put. And, and why we didn't have this? This is such a great cool, and why, why we don't have it? And, and then I said, because you never... I don't think you, you would use it here because in the club, it's, the problem is uh, uh, you don't have time. The players come, train, and then maybe uh, they have uh, some, uh, the physiotherapists go and uh, uh, do their thing, uh, but they don't have time to really uh, go to a terminal and do anything. So, uh, and in the World Cup, they have this time, obviously, because there are like one, two, three weeks together. Uh, so what we do at Bayern now, we adapt it a little bit f for the need of the player in, in, in the club surroundings. So, um, so we, try, we take this tool now and try to make it even better. So that's what we do, what that's we're great. doing right now. Yeah. And we didn't tell the players to come and talk to you about getting the SAP solution. They, no, no. they did that on their own, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, hey, Ben, let's go back, let's go back to you and, and uh, again talking about data around fan engagement. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing as it relates to the platform again. You know, we talked a little bit about that earlier, but um, let's show, I've got, we've got a couple of slides here that I think could, could give the audience a sense of the type sure. of problem and the challenge that these teams are, are faced with. Let's, yeah. uh, let's yeah. talk about so, that. So we, we view this as the, uh, the data conundrum problem. Um, and I said earlier that fans uh, follow their favorite teams on, on Twitter, they like them on Facebook, they, 
you know, maybe buy something online with a MasterCard and at the team store with a Visa. Um, so all of this data resides in, in those third-party applications. Um, and in addition to that, um, fans behave very differently um, in the social world versus the real world. Um, so unless you can really bring all of this information together, um, it's very difficult to, to make the, the right assessment of an individual. Companies for a long, long time have realized that um, we need to bring all of this data into one central, central uh, data warehouse. Um, but even then, it's still difficult to make sense of that data in, a, in an efficient way. Um, a lot of companies and organizations go through very manual kind of deduping processes. They've got um, programs that they write that can um, you know, look at various sets of data. But when it comes down to it, this process has to be completely automated. Um, um, and so we went to work on uh, a, uh, an algorithm that we call Fan Tracker. And uh, what our Fan Tracker algorithm does is it's able to continuously data mine all of these huge data sets and look for clues um, that can correlate with each person through each data set. And when it finds a match, then it consolidates that profile into one single view. And then once you've got the one single view, um, you know, it's, it's great because you can see everything that this person has done uh, over the course of their engagement with that particular team. But then really the interesting things start to happen where um, we can look at their behavior in real time. We can you know, follow them on Twitter. We see what they're posting on Facebook. And you know, maybe on Monday, uh, Spencer Higgins is, is sad because his daughter you know, broke her leg in a soccer game. And so when Spencer receives his email newsletter, then the team might want to you know, put a, a, a get better uh, uh, message in that email newsletter. So combining kind of predictive analytics, um, you can begin to measure the real-time uh, uh, mood of an individual. You can look at purchase intent. You can look at purchase behavior in certain contexts. Uh, and then you can really establish a relationship with each individual fan and then engage with each fan in scale. Without, uh, without crossing over the, because I know a lot of fans and my kids are the same way when they get, um, when they turn on their computer and they do some Google, uh, uh, they're surfing around the internet and they're looking at a couple of products and then all of a sudden they go in Google again and those products are available on the right hand side. That completely spooks them. <laughs> they they want to they say they want to get off the grid they say off the grid but this is really much different than that right I mean you're trying to create a personalized engagement with the fan rather than trying to creep them out I mean this is this and this is what ultimately fans want they want to be engaged and can and feel connected to the to the sports teams yeah yeah so I, I mean it's it's very important to um, engage with a fan in terms of uh, delivering what they want and within the context of what they want. So we're very careful to, um, you know, follow MMA and TCPA and FFA and oh, the privacy, ABC to EFG guidelines. The privacy laws. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. absolutely. So, um, you know, but then when it comes to actual, you know, open internet ad serving, yes, you know, when you are in the market for a car and then you go to another website, you see you see a lot of ads that uh, reflect that browser kind of based behavior. What we try and do is, is integrate their browser based behavior with their actual profile and, and, and what they want and, and who they are to really um, uh, focus in on exactly what, what they want. So, you know, if they're in the market for, for tickets and they're, you know, on a ticketing web page for however long and, and um, you know, we know that they want to buy a ticket. When a ticket becomes available, then the team has that ability to reach out to them yeah. through the channel that they prefer to communicate with and make that, uh, that ticket offer. Yeah, that's great. So we're, uh, we've, we're running a bit short on time, so I've got, a, I've got one more question for each of you. Ryan, for, uh, for Duke Stats, um, obviously the, the, the site right now is version one or phase one of the project. What's next? Where do you go? Where do you go next with this project? Yeah, so I think basically what we did now was we took the data that we already had in that current database and, and just spruced it up a little bit, breathed some life into it, and allowed fans the opportunity to, to interact with it in a little bit different way. I think 
the next generation is going to be uh, perhaps some predictive stuff. We're going to get some shot charts in there. We're certainly going to make more use of the data that we collect from the sport view system that we installed in, in Cameron Indoor Stadium. Um, a number of college teams now have that system. Duke was the first to put it into a college venue. Uh, other universities that played their, their home games at NBA arenas had it because the NBA installed all of that uh, into, into all the different teams' uh, arenas. So I definitely think we're, we're going to go there. Now, there's a fine balance. Um, it's a lot to what Michael's talking about. It, it, in other words, what do you want to share with people? Well, you're up here today having to try to figure out what do I tell them and what do I not. Some of this is confidential. Same thing with SportView, all the player tracking. <coughs> There's a lot of information there and, mm -hmm. and any kind of that software where they can tell where people are and how many times they dribble and how well do they shoot when there's a player within two feet of them. Our coaching staff might not necessarily want the rest of the world to know that. Uh, right. They might want to make those other coaches dig through that information themselves, thank you very much, and not just go to goduke.com and figure it out. And so I think... We've got, that's a, it's certainly a conversation to have with the coaching staff and with the programs, but I think that's, that's another phase without question that we can add. Um, and then down at the bottom, this is just an example of a, a core diagram that uh, an undergraduate student created as part of a hackathon, kind of a contest that they held on campus. And, I, and going back to what I was mentioning before, reaching across the aisle, kind of that olive branch to campus, and then and the continual usage of the, the brain power that we have there, that's another area that, that we can continue to work with them, is here's our data. You guys go crazy with it, do whatever you want, come up with all kinds of different visualizations. You're smarter than we are, and then we can, we can showcase it as part of this Duke basketball product that people from far and wide are going to engage with. It's, it's just a way to, you know, this project in totality allows everyone from the people working on it to the people then using it to, quench their thirst for Duke basketball, in, sure. in a sense. There, there's yeah. a tremendous amount of passion uh, for the program, as I mentioned before, and it's, there's, the people that follow Duke basketball oftentimes don't follow one player. Um, that's just not the nature of college athletics because there's so much roster turnover. You can tend to do that at the professional level because you might have a guy on the team for 15 years and you just love him and that's why you love right. the team. Oftentimes in college sports, you love the program or you love the yeah. school. Maybe you went there, had a relative, That's a parent. So it's just a different kind of thought process on, and when it comes to the fandom in college. And so this tool allows people, you know, you pull up that list that we had before with Emil Jefferson, and suddenly people see the name Randy Denton, or they see the name Mike Jeminski, and they Mike see Jeminski, Sheldon, yeah. and it's, oh, that's right. It, it, it allows them to tie into the history of the school while through the channel of the current players. Right. And it's something that Coach K tries to, to instill in his program every year. He has uh, his K Academy Fantasy Camp. And, and one of the things he loves about it is bringing back some of the players that he had from different generations. So he's got guys that played for him on this first national championship game team in 1986. They played the national title game. And so guys from that team, Jay Billis included, who many of you obviously know with his work now at ESPN, Mark Allery, a number of those guys come back and interact with the current players. And it, it ties everything together. And this is kind of a digital version of, of what that camp is in essence, and it allows everybody to be a part well, of it. Well, it should certainly increase the level of engagement that you have with your fans that are going to your current database. I mean, I know NBA, when they turned on the new NBA stats page in 2013, they had a 40% increase in traffic going to the site. And then once people were there, people were staying twice as long. So I would assume that uh, you know the the the, addi the additional visualization, the ability to compare players. Like I'm a fan of Duke basketball, going back and looking at the players that I remember from the '80s and seeing how they measure up to players now is uh, is certainly interesting to me. I think yeah, the, the old database, and um, it's certainly not to diminish anything that that was, but no, it read more not. like a box score. Right. And and you know I always look at it because the box NBA score. was the same situation. Yeah. They they turned a focus on this area and just made an improvement. To yeah, it. and a box yeah. score you. That's going to answer whatever question you had. You know, how many right. points did this guy score? You look at the box score, that answers a question. This database helps ask the next question. Yeah. So you, you answer the question, you see something else there. Oh, while I'm here, I don't know, let me, let me mess around with this. And it keeps people there. And then to your point, Ben, about all these different ways that people are interacting, if you then embed that within your website, and now you're able to market auctions to them or season tickets or donation possibilities, and then our digital partner, uh, New Lion, is the school, and they handle all of our donation stuff, all of our auctions, website, mobile, ticketing, everything. So then we can see how people are interacting. Sure. We get them in the site, they stay on the site, and then we, we can tell if they've bought tickets, and if they have, well, then maybe they'd be interested in this auction item. 
or they've bought three basketball auction items, maybe right. they'd be interested in tickets, or maybe they'd be interested in giving, and it, it, you can start to um, understand them, per, more market to them in more of a personal way uh, to, to what you guys were saying before. Well, we, we certainly have a lot of students here in the audience. Um, I, see, I, I would assume that some of them are going to come talk to you to try to see if they can be part of the, the next phase of the project, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, thank you for that. So, Michael, let's go, let's go to you. What's, when, when you look at the way technology and analytics has changed the game today, do you see that the game is becoming a bit more um, predictable, in a, in a sense, the way, that, uh, the, the way that teams are playing? Is the, da is the data and the, the analytics helping the teams become a bit more predictable in the way that they perform? Yeah, I think so. Um, the more and more coaches uh, use, uh, uh, use match analyzers and uh, technology for their work. And um, uh, so it's, it's all about, in, in soccer, it's all about the numeric advantage and the movement of the player. And you have to analyze this. And, um, and, the, and the tactic is the result of, out of this. And uh, so I give you an example of what, what for, for, for it uh, as we played. You don't, probably don't know the, the teams uh, we played against Bayer Leverkusen uh, in the German Bundesliga. And uh, they had a new coach. <clears throat> the coach was before uh, in a uh, Red Bull Salzburg. Uh, and so we didn't have any matches to analyze from the team with the new coach. So we looked at uh, Salzburg, what, what the coach did there. And uh, the interesting, interesting thing was, because this coach also uses a lot of tactic and a lot of uh, uh, analysis uh, for his work. And the interesting thing was that it worked. The, the, what, we, what we analyzed uh, at Red Bull Salzburg, exactly we saw uh, in, in the game with Leverkusen against us. So that means that it's, the game is getting, through the use of technology and uh, match analysis, it's getting more predictable. And uh, the game is changing. I have, it's a good, a good metaphor for it. It's, it's uh, like if you compare it with a chess game, um, I think maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, it's, it's, it was different. It was more like kick and rush. And uh, you have like, if you have two chess players who are just beginners, it's like a normal board game. And if you have two masters, uh, it develops its beauty. And uh, that's the same with, with what's happening with soccer right now. If you, yeah, what, uh, that's uh, what I think. Great, thank so you. So I think it's, it's getting definitely more predictable. Yeah, yeah. And then Ben, one last question to you. So. Uh, you know, they're managing 10, 15 different data sources right now with respect to the fans. Um, where do you see them three to five years down the road? Where is this, how is technology going to change? I hear a lot about teams wanting to provide fans with um, how long it takes to go through the restrooms in, the, in their certain section of the team. I mean, the, now you're bringing in the venue data, right? I mean, where do you, where do you see this uh, going in the next three to five years? Um. You know, it's, it's, it's really all about uh, ubiquitous computing, um, or otherwise known as the, uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, the implications uh, or applications um, are going to change the way, change life as we know it, um, especially when it comes to healthcare and transportation and energy. I mean, who wouldn't want to um, be able to sleep an additional 10 minutes um, because your alarm clock knows that the train is 10 minutes late, so it automatically uh, delays your, your alarm clock. Um, and so people are passionate about this. I mean, we are hardwired to be efficient and save time and save money. But when it comes to, uh, to sports, that's where people are, are really passionate. And um, sports teams and brands that invest in sports have an opportunity to be at in the middle or, or near the middle of this uh, of this value chain, um, you know, if uh, if that same person that would want to sleep 10 minutes later uh, to get make sure they get into work in time, I'm sure that they would wake up an hour earlier if LeBron James was serving egg with muffins at a McDonald's and signing autographs. I'm sure they'd get up <laughs> probably more than an hour hour early. So. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge is that teams have to begin now. Um, 
you know, in terms of one of your other questions, I don't know if sports teams really have a machine-to-machine -machine strategy in place. Not yet. Um, um, but, you know, if that core data model and engagement automation solution can be put in place, then they will be prepared um, for the Internet of Things when it becomes uh, mainstream. Gotcha. So we've got a number of questions from the audience. Uh, Michael, here's a, here's a good one for you. Are the analytics a factor in acquiring new players through the transfer market? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's actually a big, big part uh, from where, where we in the future will use uh, things like the HANA database very well because uh, right now we are collecting data all, of, all around the world from players and uh, um, uh, scouting data like uh, how many successful passes, uh, how many challenges he won and uh, you're, you're able already to collect almost every league where you're looking uh, for new players um, to get data from these leagues. So uh, um, what we do is, again, we combine this data with video material and uh, it's kind of a pre-selection before we actually going to Brazil or actually going to uh, Spain um, to see if this player is some, uh, is, 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 uh, is a player for, uh, for, for Bayern Munich. So um, it's, it's a, scouting is actually the biggest part where, this, where technology really can play a part. I mean, what's, what, uh, what we're working on uh, right now is uh, automatic player report where you, uh, to make it simple, to hit a button and then you get uh, all the video footage that explains or describes the player. So what I, what I tried to tell you before, like if you want to describe a player, it's not enough just to say, okay, how many successful passes a central defender has. You want to see how many uh, successful passes he has under pressure. And you can measure or you, you have the data already to, to do that. Um, you just need the technology uh, that helps you to do this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and lots of money, of course. So that's uh, <laughs> well. There's uh, there's some really good questions in here about Coach K and how Coach K uses data. But I think I'm uh, I think I'm getting the hook. So we're out of time. But uh, thank you for attending today's session. Please give a round of applause to our panelists. If um, if anyone wants to speak to any of our panelists, they'll be available at the SAP booth for the rest of the rest of today. So thanks again for coming. Bye bye.